we'll turn our attention to uh, mission and ministry here in uh, Western North Carolina. And uh, speaking to us will be uh, uh, Scott Oxford, who's been uh, ordained for 27 years, all of that time spent here in this diocese. Uh, he currently serves as the historiographer of the Diocese of Western North Carolina and rector of the church in Black Mountain. He is a ninth generation North Carolinian and he has entitled his remarks this afternoon Appalachian Apostles. Scott Oxford. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That was a big lunch. <laughs> and I'll see you. <laughs> well, good afternoon. It's great to have you here on this special day. It's uh, wonderful to talk about the church and to consider the incredible mission efforts and commitment to the gospel that so many have had in this place, and that's why we're, we're still here. There's an old adage, a stereotypical adage, that says, the Baptists came to the mission field on foot, the Methodists arrived on horseback, the Presbyterians came in the stagecoach, and the Episcopalians waited for the Pullman car. <laughs> I actually told this to some young folks once, and they said, what is a Pullman car? <laughs> uh, but there is uh, no truth in this when it comes to the church in the Appalachian Mountains of Western North Carolina. Just a little bit of perspective, these hills have been in the making for mm, between 400 to 500 million years, give or take a million. And the Cherokee and the Catawba tribes of Native Americans found God here about 20 to 25,000 years ago. The first whites to arrive in this neck of the woods were the Spaniards coming around mid-1500s. And one of the uh, soldiers in a journal said that upon every peak, they were confronted with the scene that lay before them. He said the mist among the ridges looked to them like a vast ocean of mountains. The first Episcopal clergy in this area, we think, we aren't sure if he was in this area, but Charles Wood Mason was an itinerant Anglican preacher from South Carolina. We know that he went into the back country. We do not know of South Carolina. We don't know if he uh, came into this neck of the woods, this far north and west or not. But I think we can get some idea of the sectarianism, uh, the prejudice, and the downright hatred that many people encountered here from different traditions or customs. And Stuart alluded to this earlier. When Mason made it to one small community where he was going to have an open air preaching, and he stayed in the tavern, as was the custom, but was gathered around by many Presbyterian men who were well drunk <laughs> and threatened to throw him and any black gowned son of a bitch they came into their town behind the huge fire in the tavern. And he said, I'm certain they would have done so had it not been for a few other travelers who made their way into the tavern to break up the fight. The next day, the same crowd was there, still drunk, he said, with their dogs, making all sorts of racket to break up the small prayer meeting that he attempted to hold. This would have been about 1760. But we do know that uh, it's also a scene of the attitudes, of the attitude, not unique here, but the attitudes, and those play as much in the development of the church as any in this part of the world. The first Episcopal worship that we know of in this part of the country, west of the Catawba River, took place in Lincoln County in 1786. Robert Johnstone Miller, a lay person, uh, well, read morning prayer and taught catechism. There's a wonderful display next door from the folks at St. James Lenore that detail uh, much of his life. It's a wonder we have so much material available. I'm grateful for bringing it. 
But as he was a teacher and committed to the church, it's interesting to look where he came from, and lo and behold, he was born and reared in Scotland, in the Scottish Episcopal Church, the group of non-jurors. Moved to Charlestown, Mass. in 1774, fought as a patriot in the Revolution, was wounded. And after the war, he followed the Methodist movement, which was still part of Anglicanism at the time, followed them south. However, when the, uh, the Methodists of the day under Thomas Coke decided to make formal breaking from the Anglican tradition, uh, Miller cut ties with the Methodists. Somehow, in, I don't know how, he made his way to Lincoln County in 1786. And there met Mary Perkins, daughter of gentleman John Perkins, who was one of the chief uh, scouts here in this part of the world, and also one of the largest landowners because of his great scouting ability. He was the scout who led Spangenberg and the Moravians through the mountains until they found their location in Wakobia. In 1794, we see that he was present. Is that all right? Can you all hear me? Anyone? Uh, that he was present at the election of the first Episcopal bishop in North Carolina, Charles Pettigrew, even though Pettigrew never took office. That same year, there, of course, was no organized diocese in this state. No organized Episcopal church, but there were a whole lot of Germans and a large Lutheran contingent in Lincoln County. So he followed his call to be a pastor, was ordained a Lutheran minister in 1794, but on the back of his ordination certificate it read, until such time as an Episcopal diocese is formed in North Carolina. He undertook incredible missionary tours on the part of the Lutherans. He was the only English-speaking Lutheran pastor in North Carolina. And we have records of his tours going throughout the mountains of North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina. They truly did rival the journeys of his contemporary Francis Asbury Methodist. He continued to faithfully establish and serve Lutheran congregations. Uh, throughout the Piedmont and mountains, foothills. But in 1821, four years after the establishment of an Episcopal diocese, he made his way to convention and sought ordination at the age of 63, 63 years of age. And he was ordained in the morning as deacon and in the afternoon as priest. <laughs> He continued to uh, serve the Episcopal Church and work very faithfully and closely with his Lutheran brothers whom he had known and served for 30 plus years. And he established in, in 1823 what was known as the Fraternal Union between the Episcopal and Lutheran denominations in North Carolina. Revolutionary. It predated where we are today with our relationship with the Lutherans and Episcopalians. This fraternal union exchanged representatives to Senate and to uh, diocese, also allowed for preaching in various locations. However, with the election of John Stark Ravenscroft in 1820, uh, 1820 the same, uh, 23, excuse me, same year, uh, Ravenscroft put an end to that because he was sectarian of all sectarians. He was very, very threatened by any other expression of Christianity uh, publicly uh, and especially privately. And he basically, in communication with Miller, said that he had wrought untold damage to the church. So for the next 11 years, Miller continued to serve small congregations uh, throughout what are now uh, Burr, Caldwell, Lincoln, and Rowan counties. And unfortunately, at the end of his life, in 1834, at the age of 76, he considered himself as a failure. But that spirit of loving service that he undertook on the part of the mountain people seemed to be uh, passed along to all the succeeding missionaries that came into the region. He had set a foundation of loving care. And that seems to be one of the principles we see over and over again with the missionaries coming here to the mountains.